All right, welcome, boys and girls of all ages, Bible lovers and people who just want the meaning of life. You came to the right place. We're going to be looking at a book that wrestles with that very question. Uh, before we do anything else, why don't we ask the Lord to be with us in uh, prayer, shall we? Let's go. Father, we thank you that we have the time to spend a few minutes in your word tonight. Lord, this is a, a book that I have never taught verse by verse. It's going to be a new venture for me. And uh, I thank you that Pastor Nathan is also here to help with this process. Our desire, Lord, is to grow in our knowledge and wisdom, and particularly as the book of Ecclesiastes will tell us to understand the meaning and value of the fear of the Lord, what it means to have a life that has reverence towards you. And toward that end, we pray that our time will be blessed and that we will grow into the men and women, students of your word that you have called us to be. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Hey, as you guys could see, there is a big light shining on me and there is a phone that's also on me. If you can't make it, this is going to be on the Shelter Rock Church page, Facebook Live. And it's, it will be live to see it and you can catch it up later. And then within a few days, it's posted on our website under the topic resources. And then you go down to uh, a Bible class and you will see Ecclesiastes. And there will also be quizzes that you can check out if, there is, if you're watching it live. Usually the quiz will be posted about 30 minutes to a couple hours beforehand. So you can actually look at the quiz at home and still participate. And you first may think, quiz? What's the deal with a quiz? This is church. We don't work in church. And uh, well, boys and girls, we do in this class. The bottom line is... I have found that people who take quizzes remember more of the text than those who don't. It also becomes a little bit of fun to, uh, you know, go through a passage and see what you remember. And actually, when you will take a quiz, you may say, oh my goodness, out of the 10 questions, I got only six right. But the bottom line is because you were in the class, you got six right. And there were those who would just take it raw. They got none right because they just didn't know the material at all. So you will gain knowledge regardless. And then when we go through the quiz, you fill in the right answer and they build on each other. Now, there's also a part of me that is sadistic by having a quiz on the very first night of class. What kind of teacher is that? An evil, sadistic one. So I always have a quiz and even on the first day of class. However, tonight, because it's, you know, first night, it's only five questions. Five lovely questions to get the blood going. You know, if you ever work out, you got to stretch first and, you know, get ready for that jog you're going to do. That's what our quiz is today. Also, a little framework for tonight is I'm going to do the introduction for Ecclesiastes, and then Pastor Nathan is going to take us through chapter one. The primary reason for that is, well, number one, he's really smart and he'll do a good job on that. But number two, I have an elder meeting I have to go to. And so uh, I told the elders, I got to show up at my class first, then go to the elder meeting. And so they're giving me grace to do that. And uh, so we're going to begin and dig in. All right. You guys ready to go over the quiz? Okay, here we go. This is quiz number one. And the first question is this, what is the meaning of life? Meaning of life. A, 42. B, glory God, I should say glorify God and enjoy him forever. Avoid carbs. The one who dies with the most toys wins. Well, that one be probably North Shore of Long Island. You know, there's a lot of people who have that mindset. By the way, A, 42. Does anyone know what that comes from? What is it? No, no one knows where that comes from. <laughs> that comes from a book and a movie, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe. And they do this great study of what is the meaning of life. And they go to this giant computer. And at the end of this long, long investigation, it comes up with the answer is 42. So if you are literary and enjoy books, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Universe, the answer is 42. And you can give yourself a pat on the back for knowing that. Um, the, the answer is really 
Um, I mean, you could, you could speculate on this, really, but I'm putting the answer to the uh, shorter catechism of the Westminster Confession. So a catechism is a set of questions that you ask your children as a parent to help them understand the Bible and theology. And the very first question is, what is the chief purpose of humanity? And you want your kid to come up with a right answer to that. But the answer that the Westminster Catechism gives you is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. And so that is as good as any meaning of life question. I love it personally. And if somebody asks me in an elevator, why do you exist? That is the answer I would give, to glorify God and enjoy him forever. That answer is not given in our book. So when we look at Ecclesiastes, we are wrestling with the meaning of life, but we are not going to be coming up with like a cookie cutter, simple answer. And we'll go over the nature of Ecclesiastes a little later. So that is the one that I am looking for. Number two, what are the wisdom books in the Bible? What are the wisdom books in the Bible? So the Bible is filled with various genre, styles of literature. You have the law, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers. Then you have history books, which would be 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles. And another example would be the book of Acts in the New Testament. Then you have poetry, um, books like the book of Psalms. However, Ecclesiastes, you might say, checks off a couple categories. One being it's poetry, but secondly, it is wisdom literature. And the books that are most associated with wisdom literature are Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, and Job. However, however, there's wisdom literature in other parts of Scripture interspersed throughout the Bible. And you could argue that the entire Bible consists of wisdom. However, the wisdom books would be usually defined as these three books in terms of the, the whole of the book. Now, that is important because being that this is wisdom literature, you have to interpret it and understand it as wisdom literature. Let me give you an example. So I'm trying to explain to my daughter why she needs to obey her curfew and come home at 10.30 at night. Now, I could just say, come home at 10.30 at night. And if you don't, you're grounded for a month, you know, something like that. But if I'm trying to explain to her the wisdom of coming home by 10.30, I might go online or open a newspaper and show her, look at this car accident. Wow, two kids died. What time did that happen? The kid looks at the page. It happened at 12.30 a.m. Hmm, isn't that interesting? Oh, here's another article. This is a sad one. This happened at what time? Well, it was 1.30 a.m. And before you know it, your son or daughter starts to realize bad things happen late at night. So wisdom is get your butt home on time. It doesn't mean that if you're out late, it always is that you're going to get in a car accident, but there's higher odds. And so wisdom is like that. It's, it's, it's wrestling through these things, not necessarily with precise answers, but it is looking at what is the wise thing, what is a reasonable conclusion, and that's very helpful. Number three, for the teacher, chasing after the wind reflects A, a goal, B, meaninglessness, C, hope, D, desperation. Anyone take a guess on this one? Well, the book connects it with meaninglessness. What will say meaninglessness, meaninglessness, or vanity, vanity, says the teacher, it is a chasing after the wind. That is an important phrase um, to understand, but it is connected with meaninglessness. Uh, by the way, little funny story, a pastor friend of mine was uh, preaching outside in uh, Colorado and uh, it was very windy that day and be you know how wind affects a microphone you hear you know all this sound so this is what the pastor said from the platform please pardon the wind coming from my behind so you know there are other meanings of wind <laughs> but this is not one of them this is not one of them next one number four 
The book of Ecclesiastes never mentions A, the Lord, B, God, C, joy, anything unorthodox. Now, this makes you curious. What is it going to be? Now, if we're studying the book of Esther on Sunday morning, Esther never mentions the word God, Elohim, or Yahweh. It just doesn't come up in the book of Esther. In Ecclesiastes, God does get mentioned, but the formal covenant name of God, the Lord, or Yahweh, does not get mentioned. And uh, by the way, just a quick reminder, in your Old Testament, whenever you see the word Lord, and it is in all capital letters, that is the polite English rendition of Yahweh. And because Yahweh is a sacred name in particular, as a courteous way of translating to the Jewish folks who don't pronounce that name ever, it's become an English tradition to always translate Yahweh as Lord with all capital letters, which is the same pronunciation as the word Adonai, which means literally Lord. Um, and, except when you translate Adonai, it goes small letters. And, and that's the difference. But the Lord, the covenant name of God is not mentioned in Ecclesiastes. Number five, there are two characters or writers in the book of Ecclesiastes. The narrator, the teacher, the Greek style chorus, and the Lord. Well, I kind of answered the last one for you already. But I bring that up because in, in Job, the Lord gets mentioned. Remember, the Lord speaks to Job out of the whirlwind. And so in that wisdom book, the Lord has his say. But in our text, there are two characters that are mentioned. The narrator and the teacher. And we're going to talk about those a little bit more. Pastor Nathan will give you a little bit more insight as we go on. So <clears throat> you probably learned a couple other things. There can be more than one right answer. And you're like, hold on now, why are there two right answers? Sometimes three right answers. Once again, I am a sadistic teacher. And when I went to Stony Brook University, the classes always had multiple, multiple, meaning there can be more than one right answer. And if you don't get all three right or all two right, you got the whole question wrong. And just like it blessed me as a college student, I, in turn, want to bless you and have that same joy. Here I am, 60 years old, still carrying baggage from college, but I'll never let go of it. So, anyway, with the most generous grading you can give yourself, did anyone get five out of five? Good for you. Excellent. Ex Wayne, my man, he, he still hasn't lost it. I'm glad to see. I'm glad to see. Um, four out of five? Good, good. See, that's not bad. First day of class, you're doing pretty good. So that's good. So here's what I want to do now is turn your sheet over to the one that looks like this, if you can even see what's on here. And I want to give you a quick rundown of these basic understanding of looking at this passage. Um, and also, I want to point out, you have received, if you should have, a text of Ecclesiastes. If you notice this text, it has the whole book on it. Nice, huge margins. This is so you can write notes. Anything you write, even if you never look at it again for the rest of your life, you will probably remember more because you took the time to write it down. It's the way our brain works. And so your uh, document like that will probably help you on your uh, journey. So title and purpose. Let's look at that one. The name Ecclesiastes comes from the Greek name in the Septuagint. Somebody help me. What in the world is the Septuagint? Say it again. It is the Greek translation of the Bible. And the number 70, Septuagint, that's what that means, conveys that they believe it was 70 translators or 70 scholars, 70 rabbis who, who translated the Hebrew scriptures into Greek. But when they came to this book, they called it the teacher. And the Greek is where this word comes from, Ecclesiastes, just means the teacher. And so that's why it conveys that. But we just have it transliterated for us and it means the teacher. 
Because that is, you might say, the star of the book, the teacher giving us his ponderings. And it's uh, the Ecclesiastes ultimately infirm, affirms life and joy, but only as an end result of a struggle with the brokenness of life in a fallen world. And one thing you're going to discover in Ecclesiastes, there is a struggle. There is a struggle. In fact, there was something I did not mention in the quiz, which I'm going to bring up right now. In this question number four, the book of Ecclesiastes never mentions God. No, it does mention God. I said never mentions joy. It does mention joy. But this last one, anything unorthodox. It does mention things that are unorthodox. In other words, we're going to wander with the teacher as he comes to a place of absolute despair. And you're like, oh my goodness, is this guy a believer? And we'll take this journey with him. Uh, by the way, it does end with hope. <laughs> there is good news at the end of the story. But have you ever noticed that there are people in your life that have gone through great trial. Could be a divorce, could be the death of a spouse, death of a child, could be, you know, the loss of a job, all kinds of things. Have you found that sometimes all that bad stuff of life makes for a richer person? Somebody who actually senses the grains of life you know, slipping through their fingers. They sense the beauty of it. They, they know. I mean, if you have a cancer diagnosis, if you have a terminal cancer diagnosis, and you're watching a sunset, you're taking it in. Because who knows? I don't know how many more sunsets I will see. But you know what? You will enjoy that sunset more than the average person who's, you know, if you're 23 years old, it's as if you're eternal. It's like, I'm fine. I got all this time. You don't even think about it. But when you've gone through crisis, when, when, let's say you've gone through a divorce, you might say to a married person, cherish and enjoy and work on your relationship. You lose a kid. You might say to someone else, hug your kids every day, you know, because they're precious to you. That is the journey of Ecclesiastes, because he is going to go through this journey to where he goes, oh my goodness, this is meaninglessness. This is worthless in the end. I mean, just for example, how many people put on their gravestone, I wish I spent more time at the office? No one. And yet, right now, could they be spending more time with their kids? Could they be spending more time with their spouse? Could they be spending more time enjoying a sunset? Absolutely. And so, Ecclesiastes wrestles with that. And we're going to go on that dark journey with the teacher. Next, author. This is a challenging one. The narrator presents the teacher as Solomon. Now, most specifically, as a son of David. Now, as a son of David, we automatically jump to Solomon. Why? Anyone take a guess? Because Solomon was said to be really wise. And so we're thinking, oh, of course, son of David, this is Solomon. But truly, a son of David is a general term used in Scripture. It's used of the Messiah, Jesus. And it can be another son of David. In other words, somebody who comes from the Davidic tradition. But because of that statement... It challenges us, who could this be? So many scholars now think that the teacher was not actually Solomon, but one whom we are to imagine is like a Solomon. In other words, somebody wise, somebody who has wrestled with life. Now Solomon definitely seems to fit the bill because it speaks of having great wealth. It seems of a man who, who followed his passions, and Solomon certainly seems to have done that. But is it him? We're not sure. And your belief that this is the authority of Scripture is not related to whether Solomon actually wrote this or not, because we know a son of David wrote it. That's what we know. And that term could be seen generally or specifically um, as to what that is. 
So here's another idea with this, though. Someone like Solomon, whom we imagine with his wisdom and power, thus, and now here's the Hebrew word, kwaholeth, or teacher, is used. So if Nathan was up to his own uh, devices, he would use for the rest of the class, koholeth, or some other pronunciation, because he probably thinks I'm pronouncing it wrong. <laughs> However, I asked him to use teacher because that's the way it's translated in most of our Bibles. So when the reason why a lot of scholars use the Hebrew transliteration is because we're not really sure who this person is. And so um, the, uh, Nathan would even give you a proposal that um, it could be the narrator using a term to speak of this teacher, kind of like Plato refers to Socrates. Like, we have no writing from Socrates. We have writing from Plato, who wrote about Socrates. And so there is a debate, did Socrates exist, or is this a creation of Plato? And so, in a similar theme, is that happening? Well, that is a proposal. But minimally, there are two characters, the narrator and this teacher. And the teacher is the one we're going on the roller coaster with. When he's happy, we're happy. When he's sad, we're sad. And by the way, somebody came up to me and said they have clear evidence that Bob Dylan did not write this book. And why do we say that? To everything, turn, turn, turn. You know, this is uh, maybe from this book, but not from Bob Dylan. Okay. Next, date. This is another challenge. Because internal evidence is lacking, the date could be as early as 970 BC. What's that? That's the beginning of Solomon's reign. To as late as the 4th century BC, which means probably a post-exilic writing. In other words, they're coming back from Babylon, and some people stayed in Babylon, like Esther and Mordecai. It, it could be from their generation, or it could be as early as 970. Issues relate also to Persian loan words. Now, what in the world does that mean? So when a Hebrew scholar is writing, they're saying, hmm, they wouldn't have known that word in Solomon's time. It comes from the Persian time. Let, let me give an example. If you were traveling... A reading the annals of somebody traveled across the United States and the year was 1692. And they go through Chicago and they're talking about it. Now, somebody's translating what this French explorer wrote and the guy says some Indian name that nobody knows what it means. But we know that in 1848, Chicago was founded and that's the same area. So somebody, when they're translating this guy's work, writes in the word Chicago, so that the people who read it have a clue what this guy is saying. But it wasn't called Chicago back then. That's the idea of a lone word. Let me give you an example in the Bible. There was a time that Abraham goes to war against these five kings, and they chase these five kings all the way up to Dan. Now, Dan is a city in Israel, but it doesn't get the name Dan until, well, what is it? Uh, Abraham gives birth to Isaac. Isaac has Jacob. Jacob has Dan. And then eventually they get into the promised land. And then the place is called Dan. So did Abraham literally go to Dan? Not literally with the name. But the name is in our Bibles, Dan. Because whoever was tr you know, putting the script together said nobody's going to understand where this is. So you put the word Dan. So there are some Persian loan words which gives us the feeling maybe this is later than earlier. Then the last thing is it's so philosophical. And you can tell in different times of history people talk about different things. But come around the, uh, the 5th century in Hellenized world, 4th century, the philosophers emerged. Epicurus and these other people. And it, could it be that this is a Jewish response to many of those 
Greek philosophers that were around in the Hellenized world, the Grecian world. So those are just possible hints as to when it was written. Once again, it doesn't have to do with the authority of Scripture here. We're just trying to figure out when do you think this was written. This, by the way, is probably going to come up as a quiz question. Meaning, when was this book written? And so now you hear me, I'm saying there's a big gap here. Somewhere between 970 B.C. and the 4th century. So if I say it was written in a quiz question, 1200 B.C., you go, Pastor Steve's messing with us here. It was not written 1200 B.C. And if I say it was written about the time of Christ, you'll go, Pastor Steve's messing with us here. It was written about the time of Christ. But if I say something in between, maybe that's the answer. And it gives us a context. Next, origin and purpose. Origin and purpose. Did somebody have a question? Okay, just want to check. Ecclesiastes validates the struggle of believers to find the meaning of life when life's experiences overtakes them. Ecclesiastes also provides insight into how resolution can emerge from such a struggle. In other words, it deals with the questions you and I are dealing with. Is it true that the unreasoned life is not worth living? Now, some have argued that. For those of us who have a little bit of a philosophical bent, we need to go through things like the book of Ecclesiastes. Can I ask you a question? Don't answer it. It's, you know, not intended to be answered. But if you lose a child, do you wonder about life's purpose? Absolutely. When my mother lost my brother, you know, for me it was losing a brother. That's a big deal. But for my mother and father, it was a devastating deal. And you start, my mother was a church-going woman all her life. And I remember two weeks after we buried my brother, my mom said, I now know when I lost my faith. And I'm like, what? What do you mean, Mom, you lost your faith? And she says, I don't think that there is no God. I, I do think there is a God. I'm just not sure he cares. Wow. I never thought I'd hear those words out of my mother's lips. But the truth is, if you're living life, there is going to be a time here and there where you're going to be wrestling. When I was in college, I was a philosophy major. And I read books like uh, Myth of Sisyphus by uh, Albert Camus, uh, this philosophy that gives you the impression that life is not worth living, that it's meaningless, meaningless. And I, and I wrestled with this, and I came running to this book of Ecclesiastes, and I wanted to find, like, is there a nice, clean answer? Was it as clean as I wanted? I, I kind of realized there's more to this than meets the eye. And so Ecclesiastes helps us on that journey. And by the way, there are going to be these islands in the book that give us a sense of hope and encouragement. And there's going to be sections of this book that kind of bring us to a place of despair. But all of it put together is helping us understand. And I remember back in those college days, I, remembered, I memorized the last verse in Ecclesiastes. Let this be the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments for this is the entire duty of man. For God shall bring every work into judgment, whether it be good or whether it be evil. That's the last words of Ecclesiastes. So what is this big punchline that's going to be hitting at the end? Fear God. Follow God. Reverence Him. The life of seeking the Lord is the better life. That's what his conclusion is going to be. Is that going to answer all your questions? No, it's not. But we're going to take this journey with Him. Finally, genre and structure. Ecclesiastes is a wisdom book. However, unlike Proverbs, but like Job, it is also a story of an autobiographical dimension to it. The narrator introduces the teacher to us, sums up his struggle, and provides a poem that evokes the depths of the teacher's struggles. Its structure is organic rather than strictly logical. 
In other words, it would be nice that it was written in a very linear way. We start with this principle, and we go to this, and this, and this, and we reach that punchline in the end. Everything is going to be great. Let's put our arms around each other and sing Kumbaya. It doesn't do that. You're going to find him go to a point where he has joy. He says, this is good. This is something to enjoy and, and cherish. And then you're going to go to the next chapter where he's saying, I'm not sure why I should live. I'm not sure why I should be there. It's all meaningless. I don't get it. And then he'll go to another chapter and, and have hope again. But that's life. That is the way we feel. And one of the things the book of Ecclesiastes does for me that I truly appreciate, it makes me feel normal. Because I am not one of these folks that, you know, when I'm in worship on Sunday, what a wonderful name it is. What a, you know, I'm singing worship to the Lord. But I go home and have a big fight with my wife. You know, did I forget the worship? I didn't. I meant it. But then I had bad stuff happen. My kid makes some stupid decision. Something happens at work. And suddenly I'm angry. Suddenly I'm in despair. That's life. That Bible people had that same experience as we do. The author of Ecclesiastes or the teacher or Koalath, he is living it and we're sharing his journey. But I think it's bringing us to a place where we have the reasoned life, why we are here. And if I was to, you know, tip my hand, I look at Genesis. Genesis chapter 2, we are in paradise. It's awesome. We are walking with the Lord in the cool of the evening. I mean, how cool is that? Honey, I'm going on a walk with the Lord tonight. But then comes the serpent and says, I will show you the difference between the knowledge of good and evil. Ooh, that sounds good. Give me that fruit. Let me take a piece of that. And along with it come all the, the wreck of the questions and mysteries and things that previously were only in God's domain. But now... Because we wanted a piece of the action, we now enter a realm in which we do not have all the answers. But, you know, my conclusion in life, you know, because I talk to skeptics all the time, I, I look at it this way. There are many things I do not understand in Scripture and in life. But I have to say, at the end of the day, I join the Apostle Peter. Do you remember in John chapter 6, all these disciples were leaving Jesus? And Jesus turned to his disciples and said, are you going to leave me also? To which Peter said, where would I go? Only you have the words of eternal life. So as we take this journey with the teacher, that is my conclusion. Where would I go? Only you have the words of eternal life. So with that in mind, I am now about to pass the baton to Brother Nathan. And Brother Nathan, because we're scattered all over this room, speak loud. Okay. Lose your voice. He goes to Iceland tomorrow, by the way. And uh, so it's nice that we have him here. And uh, you can plug your own computer in. There you go. And now I have the joy of going to my elder meeting. You will have more fun than I'm going to have. Okay. See you guys. Yeah, I'm sorry. I, I wish there was a better way of setting that up. Well, hopefully you can hear me online. I am happy to be here with you, and hopefully uh, you can see a little bit on the screen. I didn't have time to prepare a PowerPoint because I only found out about this that I was filling in today uh, a short time ago. So can I leave my specs here? Somewhere? Yeah, someone just tried to run them out to you. Yeah. You see, this is why life is meaningless, because <laughs> it's hard to find things, especially if you can't see well. Well, 
Let me just say, if I were going to call Ecclesiastes something, I would call it something like chasing after meaning. Can everyone hear me okay? If I would give Ecclesiastes a name, I would say it's chasing after meaning. And as Pastor Steve pointed out, uh, this is wisdom literature, uh, which has a very specific kind of thing. Now, he mentioned a little bit about dating the book, uh, and he mentioned these. Uh, there are some Aramaic words and Persian loan words in the book, which were not in common usage, well, really weren't in usage by Jewish people until uh, they encountered the Persians. Now, if you're looking for those words, chapter 2, verse 5, and also verse 8, chapter 8, verse 11, uh, those are examples of it. So chapter 2, verses 5 and 8, chapter 8, verse 11, those are some examples. So now, uh, I'm going to expand what Steve said just a bit. Uh, the compilation of the book uh, could have been after 539. It might have been before then, of course. But I would say as late as the 3rd century. Now, if you're interested in this at all, there's a guy named Xiao. Uh, he wrote the Hebrew book. When I learned Hebrew, he wrote the textbook. My professor, Sial's out at um, Princeton. My professor was from Princeton. Um, I took a Hebrew and it was a rough ride because I took it during summer. So it was super heavy. Uh, you were learning a lot of words uh, each day. But what was interesting is my professor told me when they took it with Sial, it's spelled S-E-O-W, and I may be mispronouncing his name, he's Chinese. He said, everybody in our class learned to pronounce Hebrew with a Chinese accent because none of them knew how, how to pronounce Hebrew. It's a, it's a, it's a, biblical Hebrew is a bit of a dead language. So they're all pronouncing Hebrew with a Chinese accent. But Xiao is one of the premier Hebrew scholars in the world, and he's written not only uh, articles but entire books on uh, uh, the book of Ecclesiastes. So I would commend him to you. Now, you might be saying, well, I'm a little nervous if uh, we don't know who the author is exactly. Well, you shouldn't be. There were probably compilers. In fact, compilers you'll see throughout the Bible. And you might say, well, then how do I know it's inspired? Well, we get a hint from the Bible. Did you know that there were prophets living in the land? Those prophets under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit often compiled things. They'd go back and edit. And what I mean by edit is they update a name, like a location. You know, first, take, for example, Steve's example of uh, uh, Chicago and the early Native American term. Well, you update the term. That doesn't, that doesn't cancel out the fact that Chicago was named something prior to that. So sometimes you'll see in the Bible an updated term or word that shouldn't make you nervous in the least. Uh, the Bible has prophetic people who often were used to compile things. So no worries there. Now, uh, here's the thing about wisdom literature, particularly Ecclesiastes. It challenges, it challenges classical uh, wisdom literature. You remember the book of Proverbs? How many like the book of Proverbs? These short, pithy ways of living. You see, in Proverbs, the scripture says that wisdom builds a house. You see that? Proverbs is all nice and neat. If you do this, then this will happen. If you don't do that, then this will happen. Very nice and neat. Well, Proverbs appears right before the book of Ecclesiastes, and I think that's on purpose. This is called canonical order. There was a reason why these books were arranged in the order that they were, uh, oftentimes. And Proverbs talks about wisdom building a house, but by the time you turn the page, the last page of Proverbs, and you get to uh, Ecclesiastes, you find out the house is dilapidated. In Proverbs, wisdom built the house, but in Ecclesiastes, the house is falling apart. The wisdom that they took for granted uh, just doesn't seem to be holding up. And the world the idea that the world worked like a machine and is trustworthy. You know, good things happen to good people, bad things happen to bad people. Well, that gets upended. You see that a little bit in the book of Job as well. And if you live life, you keep living life, you'll see that. You know, one proverb, for example, says, train up a child in the way he should go. And when he is old, he will not depart from it. But do kids ever depart from what they were taught? 
Or how about, you know, that uh, the wicked never prosper? But have you ever seen any wicked person prosper in some ways? Now, I know what you'll say. Well, ultimately they don't. Okay, fine. But my point is this, that Proverbs are just that. They're divinely inspired truisms or maxims. I believe the book of Proverbs is 100% divinely inspired, but it was inspired to be maxims or truisms. That is to say, uh, these things generally hold true. You know what? If you save money, you'll probably be pretty well off in life. Uh, You might want to slide that to the right, somebody. I forgot, this this is the pastor's phone going off uh, during the thing. So, and I'm not sure why it went off, but uh, uh, I I thought I silenced that phone. Yeah, and I'm not even sure what the alarm was for. Yeah. But anyway, my point is is this, getting back to, to the book of Proverbs, we read these things, you shouldn't read them in the same way because genre talks, teaches us how to interpret things, as you would another statement in the Bible. Certain things mean, when it says what it says, it means it 100% every time. There are some things that just are universal truths, and this absolutely always happens. But there are other things that were inspired to be maxims or truisms. Does that make sense? And so here's the thing that Ecclesiastes is challenging. Uh, uh, You know, it's challenging this idea that, uh, well, the world just works exactly the way we would expect. It's trustworthy. No, the truth is, Ecclesiastes is challenging and undermining traditional wisdom. Now, what do I mean by traditional wisdom? I mean that, you know what, if you're a good person, only good things will happen to you. And if you're bad, bad things are going to happen to you. But the world is much messier than that. In fact, since the fall, it's not normal for things to be normal. (laughs) Right? Everything is just messed up. So I think... Uh, We need to to think about this because these divinely inspired truisms or maxims that were in Proverbs, what follows it is designed to say, hey, wait a second. Just having these maxims and truisms is not enough to live life by. In fact, let me give you a good dose of reality. This, This book really is a kind of exercise in disillusionment and frustration. And you can feel it in every page. Ecclesiastes is a raw look at the paradoxes of life through the eyes of a cynical, disenchanted, depressed even, pessimistic person. This guy is Eeyore. Do you know who Eeyore was? Winnie the Pooh? He's the donkey. He always saw the glass half empty. This Ecclesiastes is just saying, this is just a dose of reality. You see, the truth is, ideal and real are rarely congruent. And sometimes we look at things and we'll have an ideal. We say, this is very, you say that person is idealistic. You know, I like to be known as an optimistic realist. (laughs) But, But there is reality that we have to face. And if you live long enough, you'll bump into it. And then what happens? Because if your faith is built on just a bunch of maxims, if you think the world is fair, especially since the fall, you're going to bump your head and realize that, well, life is messy, it's unfair, God's fair, but life is unfair. And Kohelet, this guy we're talking about, this preacher, this congregator, he's going to give you a dose. This Ecclesiastes is really God's antidote to the pie in the sky, presumptuous faith faith that reduces God and life to a simple machine that if you pull the right lever and you push the right button, you're going to get what you want. You can manipulate it. Life and God are not like that. And maybe this person is a person who has lost his trust in God, at least for a while. Or at least his trust in God's goodness. You heard this about Pastor Steve's uh, mother. Saturday night, I received a, a call from my sister. said, please pray for Lance. Now, Lance is a 
a young guy, 23 years old, that my sister mostly raised. And he had been sick since August, and he'd been going back and forth to the hospital, vomiting and weak, and, and they kept sending him home, and they gave him medication, and they diagnosed him with congestive heart failure at 23. So he had had a battle with COVID before, uh, a few months before. They put him on this medication, which just was causing him to vomit uncontrollably. And he kept going back to the hospital, and they kept sending him back home. And I told my sister, don't take him to that hospital. I wish I could name it online, uh, because it's a death trap. Take him somewhere else. I kept pushing for that. Well, things got really bad Saturday. She called me and said, pray for him. It doesn't look good. And, and they took him to a different hospital, and I said, he maybe he needs to go to Indianapolis even more because it just wasn't looking good. By the time they got him to Indianapolis, they said he had a 30% chance of living. And it wasn't long after that she sent me a text that says they're saying he has a 1% chance of living. And I'm trying to figure out how does a 23-year-old former high school wrestler at 23, my, my part, essentially a part of my family, end up like this? And then I find out there are all kinds of mistakes made. Even the doctor admitted to mistakes. One, he should have never been sent home so much. He ended up having a heart infection that they didn't catch. He had an infection in his heart. Could have been very treatable. And then when they got him to Indianapolis, they gave him a drug to slow his heart rate down. It stopped his heart. It took them 30 minutes to resuscitate him. That's when it was a 1% chance of living. And then it seemed like he was losing blood, bleeding internally. So they had to do exploratory surgery only to find that they had pierced an organ when trying to put something in him. He's dead today. He died Saturday night. This is reality. This is the, this is the kind of stuff that the world is suffused with. When Jesus returns, he fixes it. But right now, Ecclesiastes has something to tell us. So who is this guy, Kohelet? Kohelet, uh, what does it mean? Well, the word itself means something like, I'd probably translate it congregator um, or assembler. He's pulling people together, but he's doing it in the context of teaching them something. So this is why teacher is actually a pretty good translation. It's someone who pulls a group together to teach them something. And there are probably two characters here. You get the... Um, the narrator, which you see in the superscription, is kind of like, it's not even so much a prologue, it's just one verse right at the beginning. And then right at the end, you get something like an epilogue. There are actually two epilogues at the end of the story. And sandwiched in between that, there's this character, the teacher, Kohelet, who is being used by the author to teach us something about life. Now, he may have been a real person. He's certainly cast in the Solomonic line, like a very wise guy. He's called the king of Jerusalem, king of Israel later on even, and Jerusalem. So he's got this Solomonic kind of thing going on. And it actually wasn't unusual for writers of that time to take a famous person and his characteristics, insert them into a story to teach something. That may be what's going on here. I have, I'm, he probably was a real person. I don't know that he was Solomon, but may, and I'm fine if he was Solomon. But in any case, the narrator who frames this is now pour, bringing us into a story with this guy, Kohelet, or the teacher. I'll call him mostly from here on out. And he's going to teach us something about life through this. And Kohelet is a guy, the teacher is a guy, who has seen it all, and he's done it all. I mean, really, he's experienced life. Now, I lost my screen. Well, there we go. We're about to go into this. Thank you for letting me know. So, if you want to know, there is the superscription and the epilogue, two epilogues. That means at the end of the story. There's also this thing called an inclusio. An inclusio is like an envelope, uh, starting with chapter 1, verse 2, and ending at chapter 12, verse 8. It's, it's marked off by this idea that everything is meaningless. Everything is futile. Everything 
It's vanity, some translations will say. See, the author wants to challenge our assumptions using uh, the character and the criticisms of the teacher because all of us come in with assumptions. But, and in the Bible, the Bible doesn't try to clean up characters. I like that because I can relate to that person. He's not trying to say everything is nice. And if Proverbs gives you that idea, then Ecclesiastes is a good corrective for it. So the teacher gives voice through this guy to our kind of, I'll call it our shadow side. I mean, saying things that at certain moments we all think, feel, or say. Have you ever been like that where you said, God, where are you? Or this doesn't make any sense. Have you ever been there? And he's using this character to teach us something because sometimes we get off into our idealistic world. Sometimes we're so earthly, heavenly minded that we're no earthly good. So he's trying to bring us down. So here's some things about Kohelet. He never addresses God in dialogue, either in prayer or in lament. He doesn't even do it in this, in this book. And he loves repetition. You will hear him repeat things all the time. Now, the author summarizes the teacher's sayings for him and as everything, meaning everything under the sun, he'll use that phrase a lot, is Hevel. This is a Hebrew word you want to learn. Hevel. You might transliterate it something like H-E-V-E-L. Some people will put a B, but it, because it doesn't have that hard hit of the B, so it's more like hevel. Now, what does hevel mean? Well, hevel means something like vapor or smoke, and it's used 38 times in this book, by far the most of any author or any book in the Bible. And see, the words become a metaphor to say that life is transitory, it's, it's impermanent, and it's mysterious. I mean, it's filled with what seems like just random chance. It's shaky ground, and it's seemingly futile, and there are no guarantees. I mean, it seems really absurd. Life just seems absurd. You see, it's kind of like a fog. I mean, it's, it's hard to see through it clearly. You, you see that there's something out there, but you can't grab it. It's kind of like smoke. It might look solid, and sometimes it might look beautiful, but you can't grab it. You can grasp for it, but you pass through it. You know, you've heard it said, right, that it's like herding cats. Anybody ever heard that, hear that expression? Well, later on in the text, we're going to see it's like shepherding the wind. Everything is like shepherding the wind. That's the, my translation. And this teacher, he revels in his failure. It's going to sound like he's bragging at points, but actually he's wanting you to know that he has done it. He's tried it. He's lived it. He's driving that point home, but he's actually going to talk about what a failure he is. I mean, he likes to point out the failures of his wisdom. Why? Because life and God are not machines that you can just pull the lever and push the right buttons and always get what you expect. It's just not how it works. So Ecclesiastes will target all the ways we find meaning, value, and purpose without God. See, the teacher is going to de construct things. And the ideal and the real are going to butt heads. And you see, he's going, to, he's going to undermine this idea that one's destiny is solely related to one's behavior. Because you remember Job, his friends that came to comfort him, so-called friends? It must have been something you did wrong, Job. Because bad things don't happen to good people. What'd you do? And this is what Ecclesiastes is going uh, to talk about. So uh, it's going to first by, start by deconstructing time. Human effort rarely uh, <laughs> really changes anything. We're going to look at these verses. And maybe this is what we should do right now. So it says, The words of the teacher, son of David, king in Jerusalem. Meaningless. I mean, now the, notice that first verse is introducing the character the teacher. Meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. Hevel, everything is hevel. 
hevel, hevel. Or, and, and to repeat these things twice is the equivalent of a superlative. You know, uh, like we say, holy, 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 because there's not a bona fide Hebrew word for holiest. Well, the way this is constructed in Hebrew to say things are meaningless, meaningless, is to say it's all meaningless. They're trying to get, he's trying to get at a superlative. In fact, this Hebrew word kol, which means all, every time you come to the word all in your text, you need to underline it. So look for the word all or everything. It depends on your translation. It says, what do people gain from all their labors at which they toil under the sun? There's another key word, labors or toil. This is amal. It's going to show up. I mean, what do you get from all of this work under the sun? And this under the sun phrase is kind of like under the heavens. It means it's kind of like an all-encompassing phrase for the world. Everything in the world is meaningless. It says, generations come and generations go, but the earth remains forever. The sun rises and the sun sets and hurries back to where it rises. The wind blows to the south and turns to the north and round and round it goes and ever, uh, ever returning on its course. All streams flow into the sea, yet the sea is never full. It's kind of like us in some ways. We kind of get into these patterns. And it's kind of like, we're like the sea in a way. Waters, rivers keep running into it, but it's never full. It's never satisfied. I mean, life is somehow unsatisfactory. And you see, the teacher wants to deconstruct these ideas about how we find meaning, value, and purpose. And he's deconstructing First time, human effort rarely really changes anything. That's what he's saying. Now, let me just tell you up front, I told you, this guy is kind of depressed. And at times he'll seem bipolar, but what you're being given here is a raw character that's not candy coating anything. Someone we can relate to. And time erases all transitory things. That means us. You... Your dreams, your kids, your family, your loved ones, they're all erased by time. Let's keep reading it. Is this depressing yet? It gets better. Don't worry. It says, uh, all things are wearisome, more than one can say. The eye never has enough of seeing, nor the ear is, uh, is full of hearing. I mean, really, we're constantly looking to fulfill our senses, but it's never enough. We're like bottomless pits. We're like black holes. Nothing in life seems to ultimately satisfy. What has been will be again. What has been done will be done again. There is nothing new under the sun. What's he saying? Now, if I sound like I'm shouting, I just want everyone to hear me. <laughs> Well, he's saying everything stays the same. The one thing that doesn't change is what one philosopher said is everything changes. But he's saying everything stays the same. And you're going to see that this guy is almost like all over the place. Because on the one hand, he's going to say nothing changes. There's nothing novel. And then he's going to turn around and say everything's up to chance. <laughs> and this is how we feel sometimes, isn't it? I mean... We can relate to this guy. And what he's talking about here, well, let's just go on just a bit farther. It says, is there anything of which one can say, look, this is something new. It was here already long ago. It is here before our time. No one remembers the former generations and even those yet to come will not be remembered by those who follow them. It says this, when you look at creation... The mountains, the rivers, the water, they're going to be there long after you are. But what you build, the knowledge you gain, the wisdom, all these things you're working so hard for, huh, they're going to disappear. And not only are they going to disappear, nobody's going to remember it. There's no ultimate meaning, value, or purpose in the world. This is called nihilism, if you're interested in the word. Very depressing, isn't it? Nihilism. N-I. 
H-I-L-I-S-M, nihilism. And actually, Pastor Steve mentored Albert Camus. He wrote this book called The Myth of Sisyphus. And you know what he said? He says, the truth is, life has no meaning. It's absurd. And he said, the only rational thing to do is to kill yourself. This is what the guy said. But he said, except for one thing, courage, he said. Courage to keep persisting. Now, if you don't know about the myth of Sisyphus, he was a guy that the gods uh, chained uh, to, for all his life, he was supposed to push a boulder up a hill and then the boulder would roll down and he had to do it all over again. It was, he was in a rut, a huge rut. Nothing has changed. And Albert Camus says, you know, his existence was absurd and so was ours. So you might as well just come to terms with it. He said, and really the only rational thing is, because this is an irrational life, is to kill yourself, except courage, which wasn't very comforting to me. (laughs) Because why should I care about courage if courage doesn't have any meaning? (laughs) Right? So I wouldn't go to Albert Camus for answers if I were you. (laughs) It's the world. And what you're getting from this character is a real good dose of how things are in the world apart from God. So everybody's going to end up worm food. Why even try? He's also saying it's very hard to discern life's meaning. Remember, we're chasing after meaning here. So there are some key words again. I want you to look for the word all. I want you to look for the word meaningless. This one, hevel, hevel. Um, the word wisdom is going to show up as chokmah. We'll, we'll talk about that. Um, and, well, there's another one that's going to show up. Destiny or fate, some translation says. And then the other phrase is, is under the sun. That's going to show up 29 times. And let me just say, well, I'll say that later. <laughs> so, meaningless, meaningless. Havel Havalim, it it is a superlative. So this poem illustrates the futility, and notice how it's written here. NIV, the the way it's written here, you see it's written in poetic form. The poem illustrates the futility and brevity of life. Key themes in Ecclesiastes. Futility, brevity of life. These are going to be big themes. If if I was going to make out a quiz, I, I might put something like this on it. And the other thing is, Uh, I would push this date to the 3rd century, not the 4th century. So if Pastor Steve Marks, you're wrong. Say, uh, Pastor Nathan said, it could go as late as the 3rd century. But anyway, uh, such as it is. Uh, This also talks about the folly of work ethic. You know, you work so hard. Any ever felt like that? You just work hard. But life's just a continuous cycle. I mean, there's very little you do to affect it. I mean, the, the waves of the ocean are still going to come in. The river's going to go into the sea. The sun's going to rise. I mean, are you really making a difference? Why even bother? That's verse 3. <laughs> He's just warming up here. <laughs> and then verse 4 highlights, you know, uh, uh, a couple of things. But it does mention what's some, something interesting. Four elements of a- ancient cosmology, starting with verse 4. Uh, and that is, uh, that is earth, sun, wind. What's the other one? Do you see it? Water. Uh, we'll say, we'll see sea or streams, something like that. So these are mentioned starting with verse 4 all the way through verse uh, 7. But he's basically saying death cancels everything. What's the point? Now, if you're getting very downtrodden in your spirit right now, feeling vexed in your spirit. This is precisely the point. He wants to give you a real, a raw understanding of this. Verses 5 through 7 describe the ongoing and unchanging cycles of the sun. Everything under the sun. And wind in verse 6, water in verse 7. People like the sea are never full or satisfied. Just how they are. We're bottomless pits. And there's nothing new under the sun. We learn this in verses 8 through 10. I mean, it just reveals the, the futility of searching for satisfaction, especially in work. Because, you know, some people are workaholics. I've been like that before. 
You know, you look for satisfaction in your work. And I'm not saying that work can't be satisfying in some way, but according to the teacher or Kohelet, ultimately, eh, I mean, everything's predictable. Well, except for everything's to chance at times with this guy. So he, he's, he's very bipolar. Um, and then the other thing is, is, you know, some people say, you know what, I just want to make a name for myself. People will remember my name. People like to have statues erected to them. They like their names put on something. But guess what? As Chinua Achebe said, things fall apart. They will. Buildings collapse. They become dilapidated. The truth is there's no abiding fame. I mean, <laughs> how much do individual lives matter after all? I mean, people strive to be famous, but why? I mean, the truth is, if there is no God, remember everything under the sun, apart from God, life really is absurd. If there's no such thing as eternal life, all of our lives are absurd. I'm going to join in with Gohelet and say, it's just so. If there is no eternal life, Life is absurd. You can try to construct meaning. You can tell yourself, as Rousseau said, the noble lie. You know, you know it doesn't have meaning, but you make up a meaning. Or you actually admit that it's a lie and just bite the bullet and, and slog through life through the drudgery. Maybe you have that courage that Camus is talking about. I don't know about it. But if there is no eternal life, no matter what you do, no matter what name you make for yourself, no matter what you achieve, not, and it's not just you, what all of humankind collectively achieves, at some point the earth is going to die because the sun is going to expand, it'll incinerate it, and even if you could get into outer space at a certain point, the, the universe will reach what's called thermal equilibrium, it will die a heat death. We'll all freeze to death. There'll be no usable energy. I'm just saying, that it doesn't matter how long you live, ultimately you're going to die. And if there is no eternal life, I should qualify that. It does matter how long you live. If you have everlasting life, it's a big deal. But you might be able to extend your life 100 years and maybe your name 10,000. But there's going to come a point when it's all wiped out. And if there is no God, if there is no everlasting life, Nihilism is true then. Now, there's a part of me that wants to stop here because there's a great stopping place for Pastor Steve, but we've got time, so let me persist. <laughs> uh, because you're like, there's got to be a happy ending to this. <laughs> well, it, verse 12 says, I, the teacher, that is Kohelet, was king over Israel in Jerusalem. Now, notice this. This is why a lot of people think this is Solomon. I certainly think the character is Solomonic in nature. He's an ideal person to put in, the, in as, as a, a character to follow. And the reason is, he's done it all. He's seen it all. He was rich. He had wisdom. He had women. I mean, he had a, what, you know, he, he lived, in some sense, a hedonistic lifestyle. He did, he did all these things that people talk about. So he's a good person to put in here as uh, the figure. And it says... I applied my mind to study to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. Remember I said under the heavens and under the sun are essentially the same things. It's just an all-encompassing phrase for life, of all life. Uh, what a heavy burden God has laid on humankind. What a heavy burden. I mean, is that what he's done? Has, he, has God made us just push a rock up a hill? a boulder up a hill and watch it roll down again and we just repeat? Are we on, is it Groundhog Day all over again? You know? Is that what it is? I mean, it looks like Kohelet thinks so. Verse 14, I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are what? Hevel. They're meaningless. And here's the phrase, a chasing after the wind. I would translate that shepherding the wind. It's kind of like, you know, imagine you be a sh being a shepherd and trying to get your sheep together. Much harder than herding cats. You're trying to get your hands around the wind or smoke and, and herd it into some place. 
but it's not happening. And then he goes on and he talks about injustice. What is crooked cannot be straightened. What is lacking cannot be counted. What does he mean by that? Well, one thing, the world is crooked. And he's right about that. But injustice persists. And this phrase can be understood in a moral sense, like a reference to injustice, but it can also be understood uh, as a reference to the limitations of human intellect. There are just some things we can't figure out. You're going to bump your head up against reality at some point, and your mind's not going to be able to keep up with it. You're not going to be able to make sense of all of it. And this is what Ecclesiastes and the book of Job, I would argue, is, is getting at. And then it says, then verses 16 through 17, I said to myself, look, I have increased in wisdom more than anyone who has ruled over Jerusalem before me. Sounds like Solomon, right? I have experienced much of wisdom and knowledge. Then I applied, I applied myself to the understanding of wisdom and also of madness and folly. But I learned that this too is a shepherding of the wind. Now, let me just suggest to you, you might better translate this phrase uh, uh, to know that wisdom and knowledge are madness and, and folly. This is what we would say is a doubly compound objects of the infinitive, uh, 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 the infinitive to know. So it's like to know that wisdom and knowledge are madness and folly. He's kind of like saying, you know what, I've learned all this stuff, but I've realized that all this wisdom and knowledge is just madness and folly. But I do want to suggest to you that wisdom isn't bad. Uh, ignorance, ignorance is not bliss. It's actually oblivion. <laughs> we need to learn some things. But one of the things he's trying to point out here is wisdom doesn't seem to be able to achieve its goal of securing existence and meaning. Because people think, if I just get wise enough, if I just read enough philosophers or enough books, I can figure all of this out. And it will secure my place in history. In fact, it'll secure my life. If that's what you think, that if you read enough Proverbs that everything will go well for you, Kohelet, the teacher, is saying, you're mistaken. Verse 18. For with much wisdom comes much sorrow. The more knowledge, the more grief. Wow. Ignorance is bliss. But it's not bliss, it's oblivion. And wisdom, it produces grief, he's saying, and it fails to satisfy. Now, are you depressed yet? It's going to get better, and because Pastor Steve is, is the, the hopeless optimist. Uh, and he's going to, he'll teach us, and I, here's the thing, I'm, opti I'm an optimistic realist. Um, but this guy, Kohelet, at least the character is couched as very cynical, very pessimistic, very real, very raw. He's not trying to smooth out the rough edges. And the reason he's doing this is he's challenging our assumptions about life and God. It, this doesn't comport well with the prosperity gospel. And we often have these views. Now, I believe God is good, and he wants to bless us. There's, I'm not saying God. And you hear me shouting these things out tonight, you might get the idea that I'm a pessimist. I'm not. But apart from God, when we're just left under the sun, it's a mess. And it should teach you something about the absurdity of works righteousness, because sometimes we obsessively strive to outdo ourselves and others in righteousness. If I work just a little bit harder. But that doesn't guarantee you success or a good life. And you see, the other thing he, we're learning tonight, that's one thing you should learn. <laughs> it, it, it's just works righteousness is absurd. Another thing I would take away from tonight is this. God and the world are not slot machines. Please don't think that you've got it all figured out, that the world works like a m machine. It's not new, Newtonian physics. Uh, it's more like quantum physics. <laughs> and if you don't know the difference, Newtonian physics basically says cause and effect. You know, it's very linear and simple. 
Whereas quantum physics says there's randomness in this. There's a little bit of chaos going on. Everything is not predictable. In fact, some things defy prediction. The moment you think that you uh, have figured out the quantum wave, it collapses just by you observing it. For all those people who are a physics kind of person, not, maybe not me, many. And maxims on conduct are not enough for success. Proverb, proverbs are good and you should learn them. Uh, and they are divinely inspired because the truth is, the truth is if you follow them, if you save your money, that's wise and you'll probably be better off. If you teach your kids the way of the Lord, they'll probably do much better in life and not depart from it. If you follow the Proverbs, they generally hold true. But there's a kind of wisdom that transcends that traditional wisdom. It's divine wisdom that comes from relationship with God. And if you, get, if you stay in Proverbs alone and don't encounter this divine revelation that comes through experience of God and relationship, if you stay just under the sun and you're not in the sun, the son of God, life is woefully inadequate and it's messed up. So there's a difference between everything under the sun and those who are in the sun, the S-O-N. Amen? And so I hope I didn't scare you off from pursuing this because it will get better. But what I wanted to point out tonight is this. There are two kinds of wisdom. One of them is this tradition you get in Proverbs. Maxims, truisms that generally hold true when applied. And they're divinely inspired to do just that. But there are other kinds of wisdom that come through the fear of the Lord and obeying the Lord and encountering God and being in the Son and having relationship. And that wisdom transcends the other one. Because the world is not fair and good yet. But the God of the universe is fair and good, and he's going to shape those things. So we're going to, I'm going to stop there. Um, questions, comments, or concerns about tonight? I know a lot of it was background information, but we can stop there, and Pastor Steve can pick up all the pieces. I just, yeah, I made a mess. But don't let anyone fool you into believing Ecclesiastes is mostly a positive book. It's sandwiched. Uh, and there, it wasn't designed to be. <laughs> the end of it's quite good. What it's designed to do is touch on something raw in each one of us, something we've all said under our breath or thought at some point. This is a book you can relate to. It's not going to candy coat things, sugar coat things, smooth over things. And it may help you through something because sometimes when I'm hurting, I need to know someone else hurt too. Jesus, God comes in the person of Jesus Christ and becomes a high priest that can be touched. He's not so heavenly or ethereal that he can't be touched and no earthly good. In fact, we have a savior, a high priest, that is Jesus, God in the flesh, who can be touched, who was in all points tempted like we were yet without sins. We have access to him. And it's because of the incarnation that we know God feels what we feel. And it's because of the incarnation that I can relate to God because the truth is God in the abstract, the ethereal heavenly God is way so, so far beyond me, I can't quite relate. And God knew that. So he humbled himself, took on human flesh, became like one of us, became lowly like a slave, suffered in a world that's suffused with evil, felt our pain. This is a God I can relate to. I like the other part too. But Ecclesiastes will point us to that. I'm done. Questions, comments, concerns, objections? Let me pray. Father, thank you so much uh, for your word. And I pray that your word doesn't discourage us, but it encourages us, Lord. I pray that by your spirit, that as we read the words of this teacher, 
we can see ourselves in it, God, that you help us to come to greater self-understanding and also greater understanding of other people and mostly of you, God. Lord, so that we would learn to fear you and keep your commandments. Lord, that we would have relationship with you, God. I pray that you upend all of our theologies that think we've, we've got it all figured out, all of our neat packaging, God. And Lord, that you would help us to enter into the suffering, the rawness of a broken world so that we could be instruments of change, that you could use us, Lord, to transform this world back into an Edenic paradise. Not by our power or our works or our striving or our wisdom or our knowledge, but by your power, by your presence, by your supernatural wisdom, God. Help us to trust you, to serve you, to fear you, and to love you. In Jesus' name, amen.